Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 275 for Wednesday, October 14th, 2020. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. As usual, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Man, I got to figure out what's going on. I, you probably heard it. I'm crazy about sound. And when I fired off the theme music, it um, it was like a little audio hiccup, like a digital glitch. And yeah. it's been happening for like the last week. But I don't think it happened on our episode. So, of course, there's the question, what changed? And I say, as the user, I didn't change anything. But I know, of course, <laughs> something changed. Because it, it it happened on the other shows that I do, too. And it drives me crazy. So i got to figure this out. Anyway. Uh, but that's, you know, like I'm sure there's some digital. like. But if I played the song now, I don't think it would happen. See? It's just like, it's the first time. No, because it's like, you got to prime the pump. It's got to be something about like that app getting in with the audio drivers or something. Syncing up. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So I got to figure that out. Hey, um, while we're on the crazy subject of, uh, oh, don't play any more music, of, of audio and, you know, geeky computer stuff, uh, our friends at Isotope, and I say they're our friends, I, I know some of the people there, actually I've, I've performed with some of the people that work for Isotope, and I didn't know it at the time. But... Um, they are they are the ones that make the plugins that I always find myself using in addition to like the built in plugins. I always say you can live with the built in plugins in Logic, and you can. But Isotope adds some stuff. Like they have their family of plugins that interacts well. Well, there um, we talked about RX, their uh, their music fixing, adapting, morphing suite of tools. Some of which are plugins, some of which are things that you, you know, you master your audio or you, you save your audio and mess with it outside. And music rebalance is one of those tools that you previously could only use outside. And it's a pretty simple tool, although I'm sure uh, the engineers who make it would not uh, agree, where you can bring up or down the level of like vocals, bass, percussion, on a mixed track, like on a stereo track, which is magic, the right that you could even begin to mm. do that. Well, now they've made it so that it's a, a compatible plugin using ARA2. So you can do it inside your session in Logic as opposed to having to bring it out and then bring it mm. back in. So I was I was pretty stoked about that. So I just wanted to I I was going to talk about it later in the show, but we were already on the geeky stuff. I want to so. try that some the, some of those again. I use just the built-in ones, and yeah, you know, I, actually that's not true. I told you I I, mm. I bought a Universal Audio Arrow, and I bought some of the um the native plugins for there that allow me to do this intense latency-free um modeling. Like I use their right. their Fender amp model, and you know they have some mic preamp things. Yep. Um, but I'd love to try that isotope stuff. You're gonna have to give me some tips about where to, which ones to start with. Yeah, yeah. I am. Um, you know, it depends on what you want to do. Really, um, Neutron is definitely one of the ones. That's a, a channel strip. I mean, I, I, if I say channel strip replacement, that's probably a little um, misleading. But yeah, Neutron is. You know, you build your channel strip with your your gate and your compression and your I pretty much use the presets, right? I just go to logic and I say I'm a, you know doing a singer songwriter thing and yeah. this is a vocal mic and this is a guitar and you know, let it just slap things on and then tweak that stuff. So Neutron's probably not for you, but you never know. Like the the cool part about Neutron is it's one thing as opposed to you having to say, Okay, I want to pull a gate here and a compressor here. You can I mean you do that, but it all happens inside Neutron and they they have their own presets that all sort of interact with each other. That's the beauty of the isotope stuff. I know this sounds like an isotope ad. I swear it's not. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, do too, I do too many podcast ads. Suddenly I found myself in this role. It was like, oh, let me tell you about this product. But it's they, they didn't pay us. Uh, you know, well, I'm just a happy user. But they it interacts not only with the sort of the plugins in that channel strip, but you can have, you know, Neutron on multiple channel strips, for example, on, you know, each channel for a, for a drum set and then maybe the bass. And now you want to link the, the bass guitar with the kick drum 
And Neutron knows about like how to do that stuff and what you're doing over there versus what you're doing here. It, it, it becomes this intelligent engine and it's pretty cool. I mean, it, again, it, 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 you sort of start with a minimum level of complexity for which Neutron would make sense if you're doing a single, I mean, I, I would, I've used it to do just a, you know, like I want to use it on a vocal because I can tweak the vocal better with Neutron than mm. I can with, you know, Apple stuff, or it's faster to get there with Neutron than Apple stuff. So that's, that's one of them. Um, Ozone 9 is the mastering thing. And I definitely use that. Like, there's no question that they, they do a really good job. And then this RX that I've been learning about most recently, which one of the things is, you know, that um, music rebalance is part of where it just cleans up sound in like magic ways. That it that might be their their flagship tool if I if I had to pick one as an outsider because it does something that you cannot do like Neutron it arguably does it better or easier or differently than you could do with the built in Logic plugins um, or plugins in it you know it's these aren't just Logic uh, plugins you know Isotope makes them for all the platforms but um, yeah you can you can have a compressor and an EQ with your built in plugins they might not work the yeah. same way but RX like logic and, and or pro tools don't come with, you know, magic repair tools to just pull noise out of sounds and or out of sound files and things like that. And so that's arguably perhaps the, the one to, if, you know, if, if you're going to, if you need functionality, you don't have, that's probably it. Like you have some crappy track that somebody sent you and you're like, crap, I want to fix it. Well, that's what RX is for. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I will. I got to give it a try. Hey, um, we uh, we lost another uh, rock icon mm. this week with Eddie Van Halen, and um, you know I, um, I when it when I when I saw the news, I mean I I knew tangentially that Eddie was you know sick with cancer at some level, although I didn't you know realized I don't think any for several ever years, lost. yeah, for a while, right, and on and off it kept coming up. I mean, I could even go back ten years and there were talks about oh he's got throat cancer or this that you know so, but when when he passed and I started kind of processing it myself and then watching all of my friends, especially my guitar playing friends, and especially my guitar playing friends that are about the same age as me that kind of came up at that that same time. I realized, wow, you know, this is, this reminds me a lot of January when Neil Peart passed because it, you know, when I was coming up, that was like, those were the two guys that were on the cover of every magazine. If it was the drum magazines, it was Peart, you know, you couldn't get away from him. And on the guitar magazines, it was Eddie Van Halen and you couldn't get away from him. And he really, you know, Eddie, I mean, he liked Peart, but, it, you know, standing on his own, certainly he he changed the way people thought about, he added another way to think about that instrument. I don't want to say, absolutely. You know, he didn't change. He didn't, it wasn't like he threw away everything you knew before then that was Jocko. Right. But, um, with the bass, but you know, he, he had a, I mean, he did some amazing things and he wrote like, this is the part it's like, he wasn't just an amazing technician. He wasn't just a fantastic live performer. But he all he was those things, and also he was a fantastic songwriter. I mean, the songs may or may not have been for you, but they clearly resonated with lots and lots of people. And and the same was true about Peart, right? It was like you know they, these guys were the whole package. They could absolutely they could do it, and they did it. You know, and that was that's the part. That I, I think that's the thing when when looking back on Eddie and how people are reflecting. Obviously, guitar players are mesmerized by his chops, mm. but when you watch the videos that people post, lots of live stuff. Obviously, you know, his chops were every bit as advertised because he was every bit as good live as he was. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he had that vibe. I mean, he, you know, he didn't seem terribly affected. Um, he, they wrote great hooky pop songs, you know, rock pop songs. Yeah, heavy rock pop his, songs. Yeah. His, his yeah. vibe on stage was just, you know, magnetic. And so, his, you know, his you know, smile... Right. Yeah, his his you, smile you, and that just that whole vibe. I don't know. I, I saw Van Halen uh, four or five times. I can't remember with um, both Dave and Sammy. I liked him better with Sammy. You know, you can come tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> you can come tell me I'm wrong later if you want. You had to do that, didn't you? I do. Because I, I mean, it was so much better, especially the songwriting was just so much better with Sammy. I agree. And, and they actually had a singer, which was good. But the DLR years like they were 
a, a force to be reckoned with. I, like that was unbridled energy just pouring out of that band nonstop. Like they, they, I don't mean to discount what they did with Dave. They they could not have done what they did in later years with Sammy or or Gary or anybody else. Uh, because of, I mean, that, that gave them their start and they, they deserve all the credit, but, um, he live, he, no matter where you were in the arena, Eddie's personality was right in your face without yeah. being affected. Like you said, it was just who he was. He would make a stupid little smile and a grin and the entire place would warm up. And it was, I mean, I think he knew what he was doing. I mean, you do that enough, you start to figure it out. But that's just who he was, I think. Is, you know, I, I agree. And that's been kind of one of the soul-soothing things about all the tributes to him. And, you know, when people offer their own reflections, you know, overwhelmingly, it seemed like, you know, he was from an immigrant family. He worked yeah. hard at his chops at, from a very young age. I saw one video of him playing uh, beach football with some friends at age 17 or 18. That was actually pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, he was, he was a dude. And, you know, and yeah. uh, like we were, we've been talking about that Bob Lefsetz letter. Bob wrote a, you know, a long thing on Eddie and about how he, he, they practiced and they, they worked the Sunset Strip for a lot of years honing their perfection and they were ready for stardom when, when it was it, time for them to be stars, yeah. you know, they, but they kind of like the Beatles in Germany. I mean, they, they didn't just pop one day, right. They, they were, a uh, 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 bar. They were a bar band. band. Yeah. They, and they yeah. played and played and played. It's what they loved to do. Yeah. I know. So, yeah. It sucks. He is, he is an, he's an innovator. He's a genius. He is an inspiration on so many levels. And again, I, I, the thing I think about is A is chops, always chops first, but B, it was a little bit the an, antithesis of the kind of affected faux metal, you know, yeah. groups that kind of came later that were much more into, you know, that I, again, I'm not much of a Motley Crue guy. That was a little bit more, you Produced. know, metal, metal pop that was believed its own hype, you know, as opposed to just, <laughs> sh hey, again, you know, like scorpions, I like scorpions, you know, yeah. priests, I like priests, but again, and that was kind of the European flavor. And again, those are, those are some pretty freaking amazing guitars before Eddie or about the same time as yeah. Eddie. Yeah. Um, it's true. But like not, there were, not as, not there were pop. a lot of guitar players back then that were just, I mean, it was all about chops. It yeah. was an era of guitar players. Absolutely. That's right. But, but Eddie, but Eddie again, rose above all that. I mean, not, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But you know, all of the kind of hair metal that kind of came mm. after Van Halen, some really fine players, but, um, you know, Van Halen always gave you that thing that they weren't taking themselves that seriously, even though their chops would, would shred, you know, a room, you know, in early days, David Lee Roth was, was the front man of the oh, world, right? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, I've, I, so I, I I liked Van Halen better with with Sammy as I stated, but I also saw David Lee Roth well with Van Halen, but I saw him solo and his solo shows, especially like in the you know in those early years right after Van Halen uh, or after he left Van Halen the first time, uh, were some of my favorite concert memories ever. Like that dude knew how to put on a show. And Definitely. he, I mean, and he was great. I actually liked him better with his band than with Van Halen because it could be all about Dave, right? Was like it, with, was Vi in that band? Yeah. Vi, Billy Sheehan and Greg B. Sinet, man. I mean, yeah. like, like these dudes are like Zappa and, and <laughs> it, like, they, like Steve Vi literally played with Zappa, right? Like, but the other guys could have, I don't think B. Sinet ever did, but, um, he would be a good guy to get on the show. He's he's a really interesting dude. But he like the, I remember one of his drum solos was like him coming out with a like a marching band. And it was it was cool. But the show, uh, maybe other than that, was could be all about Dave. Like he didn't have to compete with the Van Halen brothers for attention or control. Yeah. And so it was I liked it better because it was like, OK, I'm going to see the DLR show. Like there's no ifs, ands or buts about it. There's no fighting. It's just going to be Dave doing Dave. And it was we awesome. talk about always be performing, right? I mean, oh in both those cases, Van Halen is a band, you know, David yeah. Lee Roth was a performer. I mean, the, that style of singing that he was so good at early on, that kind of whistle vocal, yeah. you know, way up in the range, you can't do that forever. I mean, oh. you know, your body changes, right? Yeah. Yeah. His body sure changed, man. 
Yeah. 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 And, you know, again, I don't, you know, we could go on, talk about whether he managed the transformation of his image later into his career. I don't think he did. Or whatever it is. Uh, can but I say Eddie sure did. Eddie sure did. No, Eddie did too. You know, I want to, while we're talking about the other band members, first of all, Michael Anthony doesn't get nearly enough credit for As a singer. The, the, well, yeah, his, his harmonies, even to this day, I mean, we saw him with Sammy with the circle last summer. So, well, you know, a year ago, cause no concerts this summer. And, uh, and he's still hitting all those notes. I mean, no yep. problem. And he sounds so good. And that was part of the Van Halen sound. But the other those person, harmonies, yeah. the other person in Van Halen that like back in the, in the eighties, Alex Van Halen was looked at as one of the, you know, more skilled drummers of the time. And then somehow about 10 years ago, and I think it sort of coincided with Noel Monk's uh, biography came out. He was the road manager with Van Halen for their first eight years. Um, when that came out, I think it'd be it, it, somewhere around that time, maybe because of his book, maybe not. It became in vogue to diss Alex Van Halen's drum right. chops. And I don't, I still don't understand that. Like that dude, certainly you put him next to, you know, a Neil Peart or, or, uh, you know, Carl Palmer, or like, you know, those guys. Okay. Maybe he's not at that caliber, but he certainly was playing. He probably played more shows than those guys did to more people. And the drum parts that he came up with are weird. Like they're tricky interest. He made everything groove really hard. And Yet it was still this angular thing. Like he really had a feel for hitting odd accents as part of a groove. You know, you listen to even Panama, right? Like is a pretty popular tune. Listen to the guitar solo and jump. I it I had to chart that out to be able to play mm. the drum part through that. It's eight bars. And it's just all over the place, yeah. uh, you know, so, or the keyboard. It's funny you bring that one up yeah. because, you know, just in thinking of Eddie, I've kind of dove back in. I'm not a tapping type of guy. It's not yeah. my style, but, but, you know, Eddie's got me thinking about that stuff now. And so I'm just going to relearn the jump solo, yeah. which, you know, the jump solo is eight bars of magic. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it is, it is all of the styles that Eddie did you know, in eight bars and is just unbelievable. And you know, I, it's I, melodic, I it's fast. You it's find the one. Like it's the whole thing <laughs> is all over the place. It's like this, Oh, we're going to be a prog band for a little bit here. Just hang out. And okay. Now we're back, you know? Well, yeah. yeah. Though, you know, the, then the runs that he does over those hits as the solo ends before it goes into the keyboard solo are just yeah. like, what is going on here? And then it all comes back together and it just blows your mind. So Anyway. And it all comes back together. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They were a good band. I, I always liked seeing them live. So, yeah. Well, I, I, and I would bet you have a guy like Eddie. It just elevates everything, right? I mean, obviously oh. him and his brother grew up, you know, probably pushing each other. Yeah. But he probably made, you know, Roth knew he better bring it every night, you know, if he wanted to <laughs> stay on the stage and, and probably made Michael Anthony a better player. I don't know Michael Anthony's history, but you know, probably made Michael Anthony a better player, you know, having to keep up with these guys. Yeah. I, as I hear the story, Michael Anthony was the lead singer of whatever they were calling the band at the time. It was just a three piece. And then they needed to borrow a PA. And I guess David had a PA. So he said, yeah, I'll loan you my PA, but you got to let me sing. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the, the rest is, as they say, history. So singers I, it's freaking that dude i mean talk about <laughs> you can you can see that situation unfolding right? <laughs> well you know there's the um th there i don't know if this term grew outside of the area where i grew up but certainly there there in in new england here there is definitely something called dlr syndrome you know where it's just like you're the lead singer you can't turn it off though like unable like you walk off the stage you're still that guy and it, it's certainly, I don't know, David Lee Roth, he might not be that guy off stage, but every single story tells me that he is, um, you know, and he, yeah, but you know, he pushed himself forward and he pushed that band forward. And, yeah. and he, as I understand it, he really was the one kind of driving the business forward from inside the band. Certainly their management and stuff were the, were the ones that took it and actually made it happen. But but you know, like Mick in the Rolling Stones, I I think David Lee Roth was the one that had his hand on the on the you know on the purse at least some For of the time. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, he, you know, they they make it happen, man. It's not it's not all fun and games, uh, at least. Not, well, not not in Rip the Eddie. Yeah. Thanks for the gifts you left us, and 
you know, amazing musician, amazing, amazing music. So you get to enjoy it for a lifetime now. Yeah, man. You had a, you got to play with other musicians. Uh, you got to play with dude, humans. <laughs> it was heavenly. So I drove up. So remember I moved about three hours away. So, and nice. the plan, the plan is in the winter, I want to come up in, in the normal times. Uh, I want to come up and do, you know, cause I've got enough contacts and gigs up there. I want to do either a Wednesday or Thursday through Sunday. And, you know, I can stay at friends or bandmates or whatever. And in the summertime, it'll be at least two weekends a month, maybe more. So it's a drive, you know, but actually it was kind of nice. Like, you know, I put in a couple of podcasts. Yeah. I think I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn Italian, maybe work on my music theory. I mean, in the time it's good time because you can't be interrupted with much else. So anyway, drove up, uh, the house rocker rhythm section got together. So not the full 10 piece band, um, because we don't really have a big enough place for the horns and the horns projecting stuff is still a concern to everyone. So we the invited si the horns. The science to says that vocals singers project more than horns do. More. Yeah. I thought. It was, I thought it, the last thing I read, I thought it was about both, and you know, we almost canceled it because the day before there was that CDC thing talking about you know right. how it's more aerosol and airborne than previously thought. And, yeah, but, I could be. I could be out of date on this, but the last I I'd heard, and we had some folks. In fact, it, uh, I forget which which ones of you it was, but we had emails from a few of you. Feedback at giggabpodcast dot com, please. But it, as I understood, as I sort of read it and and grok it, it was that, well, if you think about it, you're putting the same amount of air pressure into uh, either a horn or singing, right? Like if you're going to project, you're going to project. And mm. the horn is is acting as a, as resistance a on funnel. that. Right. Yeah. Whereas whereas when you sing, you're just singing. And so they said horns will go about 12 feet and singing will go about 30. They, they said was like the that, the last. But that was months ago. So I could totally still yeah. be wrong. Yeah. Anyway. So our our uh, pre get to. So we had been on the calendar for about a month. Our You know, we had a conversation about two weeks before where I was like, you know, does do it do people feel the need to get tested and they didn't feel the need to get tested and then you know a couple of days before i said did it has anybody you know done anything been out you know potentially exposing environments that you want to share and give people one more chance to make a decision whether you, you want to do this or not and i would prefer you know if everybody wore masks yeah um so uh that was the, the discussion leading up to it then we got to um and, and everybody's, you know, was pretty frank about, you know, I was supposed to do this, but I didn't. I've pretty much been in my house. Yep. No new people have been coming or going. So, the, you know, everybody kind of laid it out as to what their life was like. Uh, Nick cooked a nice barbecue for us. We ate outside, got reacquainted. It was just so nice. The vibe was so good to just kind of reconnect. Remember, it, February 15th was yeah. the last gig we played. The last time we were together was February 15th. Almost, almost, almost... Eight months. Eight months. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, we ate, we had a couple of laughs, we hung, and then um, we decided we were going to do about 20 minutes at a time because it's in a garage. Okay. 20 minutes at a time and then take a break and go outside and open up the door and air out the you know thing. And, yep. Let the and, Rona out. Uh, yeah, let's run out. And then uh, I don't mean to make light of this. I just, no, no. I sometimes get it. I yeah. have to. It's the only way I get through it. It's just for me. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Three of us wore masks. Two of us decided not to wear masks. Okay. Didn't, didn't feel comfortable. Didn't you know? Said you know we've kind of covered all this information. Yep. But three of us you know decided to wear masks. And that was fine. We were. We were maybe maybe socially distant as we go in a you know kind of a yeah. circle. Yeah. You know, be clear, you know, again, not taking in the the um, the account for the spread from singing. I wore a mask for sure, so I sung through a mask. Sure. Um, anyway, it was amazing. The biggest, you know, it was I. We had, I said, do you want to come up with a list, or do you just want to call things out and see what we remember? And everybody was like, no, let's just go for it and see what happens. So. I brushed up on a couple things and in the process of brushing up in preparation for it, I was like, Oop, I, I've forgotten some stuff. It's, it's been eight months. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. However, the, the dot, dot, dot to that is I was amazed. Nick called, um, we went around, you know, each singer got to just choose a song. And we just sure. kept going around in circles. Oh. Um, Nick called, we just started doing that song from the seventies called what you won't do for love. Oh Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. it's the same kind of four or five changes mostly throughout the whole song, but um I didn't remember the key. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it was really funny 
<laughs> that once I got the first chord, the rest of them fell into place. So muscle memory is a thing. I mean, it, it, oh, yeah. it, it was interesting what would come back. And the thing that, I, you know, I have to work hard at is harmonies. The harmonies come back as well. Your you know, muscle yes. memory in your brain is a thing as well. And so, um, one of my favorite tricks for that, if I forget, like if it's one of those things where I know I've done it, you know, a hundred times before, but it's been a little while or in the moment, it's just escaping me is I just start singing the lead. And as soon as I, and this is partially because that's how I learn harmonies. I learn the lead and then I learn how the harmonies relate to that, um, kind of in my head. And I just start singing the lead and I will naturally, like, as soon as I stop thinking about it. I will naturally find myself at the harmony. Like, like you said, muscle Ooh. memory takes over. It's like, you know that when you sing these lines, you don't sing that note, you sing this note. So just do that, you know, and then your brain is like, yeah, okay, got it. You know, but, but that whole thing of wondering what your brain will remember in, yeah. in real time. And then once you realize it actually does, there's this strange sensation of well being that comes over you. <laughs> You're like, I've got this. I can't believe it. I've got this, but I've got this. So we probably played maybe, maybe 20 to 25 songs in the couple hours that wow. we played again, taking breaks. Yeah. Um, but by and large, you know, it was like, we, we might be able to do a gig right away, but certainly if we did one rehearsal, I think we would be in pretty good shape that oh, we yeah. have enough. Yeah. And then, you know, so we played for two hours. Everybody gets to choose some stuff again. We had a lot of laughs. You know, uh, Bill was there. Our sound guy was there, which which was awesome. And nice. he taped a couple things. And Those you know, tapes sounded amazing. I You know, I hope he didn't take the wrong way. I, I, now that I'm thinking about what I said, I said, wow, you know, awesome to see for all these reasons you just laid out. And it also sounds great. I was more talking about like, wow, with captured with a phone, like the mix is like the, it's not overdriven. Like this is amazing. Uh, uh, no, I, know I, he, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that because it's literally yeah. just a couple of monitors on the floor. So it's not really mixed. Wherever I mean, he it, was sounded great. So there well, you go. Cool. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, it was mostly a sense of a connection to these people who I've made music with for so long. B this wonderful sense of well being that the stuff you've worked pretty hard to polish over the years was still at your disposal. Yeah. And, and see, and probably the most important was, you know, should the world open up, we would be in a pretty good yep. place to be able to, you know, keep moving forward. So all that stuff was really, you know, rewarding. It was great. We're going to try and do it again, uh, begin right after Thanksgiving. And I'm trying to find a place that we big enough if the horns can join us. Oh and yeah. So can try and do that. You've got to have some rehearsal facilities. In Not that big to yeah. socially distance 10 pieces. Yeah. What if you, you get, what if you call a club that you've played at that's closed that's what I did. during the day? Yeah, okay. That's yeah, what I did. <laughs> yep. So I'm just waiting to see if, if they'll let us do that. And so, um, but all in all, it was, you know, a very soul filling experience. It was really great. It was great to reconnect with my buddies. It was, it was great to, you know, play music with other humans and especially humans that you enjoy playing with. Right. <laughs> and yeah, just no. kind of great to get that kind of like, you know, in my mind, everything's falling apart. You know, 21 right. years of hard work is going to be, you know, the band's going to be flat. No one's going to remember us. You know, there, do we have the thing that we used to have all the momentum that we had yeah. where people would knew that they could see us almost every week and follow us around all that type of stuff. It just feels to me, you know, like it's just going away. Right. Yeah. And, uh, at least one part of that now, and which probably feeds to a few of the other parts of that feels like, you know, I, or who knows if it's a, a no, all of calendar 2021, how long you can hold on to this stuff. I mean, I, I would imagine most bands are, you know, having these conversations. I mean, oh yeah. Few, yeah. A few groups in the Bay area that are, that are taking or creating some kind of thing. It's not a sustainable thing and it's not a repeatable thing. I'm, n nobody has a regular gig. There's a couple of solo things. Simon seems to start, be starting to work a little yeah. bit more, which is, which is cool. And, you know, he's real careful and he's picky and, yep. but you know, he's starting to put together, you know, uh, replace some of that income. But again, for me, it was just, it was really wonderful to, you know, be with my pals and, and do something I love doing with them. And, um, just more getting that emotional reassurance that, um, we still got something. Yeah. Well, that's the key, right? You, when you were saying that the first thing you did was, you know, you ate and you hung out, it hit me. It was like, you know, the first few gigs that I did, really every gig that I've done, it has been has meant something because you know that any of them could be the last opportunity for a long time, or at least I know that. Yeah. That's how I approach him. And and yes, the playing is good, but it's that hanging out, that eating a meal together. 
it feels, it, you know, it's that, that taste of, yeah, you know, you like it, if you, if you are willing to take a small amount of risk and yet still be, you know, diligent about your safety and all of that stuff, this stuff can happen. And even just having pizza backstage or something, it like takes on a whole new meaning, like this automatic, mm-hmm. like, you know, the green room becomes a whole lot more of a sacred place. I mean, it's always been a sacred place to me, but you take it for granted is really what it comes down to. It's like, oh yeah, of course we'll get to the gig a couple hours early. We'll eat, then we'll yeah. go play, you know, like it's just Have part beer, of the, yeah. part of the routine and it's like, until it's not right. And then it's like, oh, now I'm savoring every moment of the routine, yeah, <laughs> including sure. unloading my crap at the end of the night. It's like, oh, what a, you know, I love doing this. I don't love doing it, but you know, like for the short term well, I do. The, yeah. Well, for the prospect of you never being able to do it again, all of a sudden it's, you know, yes. you see it as part of your ritual and you yes. see it as part of you. Yeah. yeah. I think that's all. About, I don't think I've ever told you this story, but um, the House Rockers are the, are the first band and only band, well, first band that I put together when I got back into music. Hmm. Um, and I, one of the guys, one of the horn players said to me, you know, the House Rockers are like a band of brothers. I've never played in a band that it feels like family. And I was like, that just struck me as weird. Like, isn't that what a band is, right? Like to me, it's just, that's just a foregone conclusion that yeah. if you're going to make a commitment to spend a lot of time with people and, and you want it to feel organically good, why wouldn't you do this stuff like have a meal together or, you know, ask how someone's family's doing or, you know, you know, stay connected. And so, and again, that's not, that's not my management style. Like in business, you know, I care about the people who sure. work with me, but I, I don't, I don't try and blur the line and say we're really a family, you know, no, we're, we have a business relationship, right? but playing music together always struck me as something different. But the other guys have been like, yeah, you know, I've had bands where we, we've been good friends and I've had bands where it's just purely a, you know, you show up and you know, it's a perfunctory thing. Yeah, you, it just never had dawned to me that if you're going to be serious about a band, you know, the, isn't that a, isn't that a, a secret sauce that translates well when you play music? Right. That, that, you know, I, the, I'm the with collaborative you. aspect of it. Yeah. But I, it's, it, it's not the way everybody not, runs. Their it's bands. not. No, I've certainly been in bands. Most of the bands I've been in have been, you know, the family aspects it, to greater and lesser degrees, but, but generally some significant level of that where it's like, oh yeah, I'm looking forward to hanging out and, and then also playing, you know, whereas, but I have been in a few bands where it's like, nope, this is just how this band is. And we yeah. show up and we play. We are friendly with each other. But, you know, every, it's kind of every man for himself. It, you know, the way yeah. I, the, the thing with one band that, that really hit me was there was a night where one of the players was, uh, had had a little too much to drink, right? And so it's the end of the night. And our guitar player was like, yeah, well, and he was the one that brought me into this band. I was definitely the newest person in in this lineup at the time. And he was like, well, you know, I mean, we acknowledged that like, okay, that's, you know, that's how this scenario is. But he's like, well, it's, the gig's over, man. It's, you know, it's not my problem. Mm. I got to go home, you know, and he left and I'm like, well, sh- shoot, like, what? <laughs> like I, I'm a huge, like, I can't. I can't, I can't bring myself to do that. Like, I don't want to be the one that says goodbye to this guy and leaves him in a scenario where he feels like he has to get in his car. Y- you know, it was like, crap, how did I, how did I get here? You know, but it was like, mm-hmm. even the, even the guy was like, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm just going to hang out here for a while. You know, don't worry about it. It's all good. You know, I was like, okay. And the bar was cool with it, but you know, I couldn't have left like the other two people did where they were just like, well, you know, end of the gig, not my problem. Pack my stuff and go. And if you really want that experience, check out a theater pit, man. When when the show is over after the final performance, the generally the musicians pack their stuff and are out of there immediately while the rest of the, like the cast and the crew is tearing everything down and you know, like like you know, resetting the, the room and pulling all the sets apart and the musicians the first time, you know, I put my stuff in my car and I came back in. I'm like, "All right, well what else do we need to do?" And they looked at me like why are you in the room? Like, what are you doing here? Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you know, we're not finished. Like we got all this stuff to do. They're like, you're in the band. 
Like you're not, you don't have to be here if you don't want to. Like, well, that seems weird to me, <laughs> but, but it also, it also seems nice. Like, <laughs> you know, but I'll take it. I'll take it. I guess. Like, if you don't need me, they're like, no, nah, we kind of have our system. Like, okay. That part I get, you know, like, you know, when somebody says they want to help pack up at the end of the night, it's like, yeah, I got my system. And that's what they told me. They're like, you don't, you, you would be more of a burden. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But they're like, but thanks for offering, you know, um, they were very taken aback. So. I don't know. It, yeah, th there are some bands like that. And I, I I, agree with you. It's weird to me, too. But it is just how some things kind of work out. Like you said, it's more business and less about the friendship. But again, just like in business, you can be friendly with someone without being friends yeah. with someone. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't envision a semi-pro gig where there's any kind of like open hostility between people. That just, just seems like no fun. But oh, And there's a whole I've, range I've been of there, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a whole different story. That's different. Yeah. I've yeah. never been in that type of situation. Yeah. Well, when I've a band been, gets popular, you know, if things are moving and the band as a whole is doing well, you, you kind of realize, well, you don't want to rock the boat, but it doesn't change the fact that, you know, these particular two members hate each other. Like, okay, but we're still going to do the gig, right? Yep. We're still going to do the gig. Okay. Yeah. That's enough of that story. <laughs> we'll let it go. Yeah. I have anyway, another story so, to tell. Um, go. Just a quick one. I was listening as I do at my desk sometimes to uh, to like live fish shows because it's you know the all the instrumental music is great for just like you know kind of putting it out in the background and getting work done. There was a sound check uh, from 1998, so from today, early on in Fish's career, but definitely they were established. They were playing at the Meriwether Post Pavilion in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, that's a big venue. I think it holds 15 to 20,000 people. I mean, it, they weren't like playing in bars, right? They were their own thing. They were established, good to go. And it was during the sound check, and, and they were, you know, you could hear them, and, and for whatever reason, the the... Uh, engineer's mic was also audible either through the monitors or whatever, but you could hear the whole conversation. It was like, Oh, I need more of his vocal or this or that. And the other thing. And then John Fishman, the drummer at one point says, you know, every time I switch my mic on, um, it, it seems like that's when we have feedback on stage. And, uh, and he's like, is there anything I should be doing differently to avoid that feedback when I click my mic on? And it just struck me as like, I mean, it's a very smart question to ask if you don't know the answer. Great to ask. But the fact that, you know, here's this guy that's been playing arenas and more for, you know, at that point, what, six years, seven years. And still not only, I mean, the fact that he didn't know the answer was interesting, but I think he was at that point starting to sing more. So perhaps it hadn't been an issue in the past, but, you know, was was still very much willing to ask the question and learn and, and the engineer was like, oh, yeah, he's like, and he's like, D when I have more of it in my monitor, does that make it feedback more? And the engineer's like, definitely, <laughs> you know, of course. And he's like, oh, well, let's turn it down a little. He's like, but is there anything else I can do? And the engineer's comment was, well, yeah, sing louder, project more. And he was like, OK. I mean, it was like all the all the norm. There was no magic in the answers. But it was my point of sharing the story was, you know, at any point in your career, it doesn't matter where you are in, you know, your station in life. There's always something to learn in a moment and, and it's okay to ask those questions. I just, I thought it was really interesting. Like, Oh, look at those guys. Like they're not high and mighty on themselves. They like, he, he, he didn't know the answer. So he asked like, no problem. And, and he got good. He got good feedback. Well, excellent. Uh, you know, good, not feedback or whatever. Yeah. It was. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, man, we have a, a great question from listener Mike that I think we should save until next week, because I think we're going to talk a lot about it's it's about a specific manner of building a band. And I I want to I want to save some time for that um, without trying to rush through it. Tee it up. He um, he was asked to join a band and. Uh, or I guess I guess they were, they were forming a band, and when one of the guys found out that there was a going to be a female singer, he said, "Oh no! Any band with a female singer uh, becomes it, it stops being a band. It becomes the backing band for that female singer. I'm out." And the guy left like he was all in everything. He was completely committed. And as soon as he found out they were going to have a female singer, it was like that is a definite like you know roadblock. No further, not going to pass go. I'm leaving. And that was mm. it. Yep. And, and so 
uh, he Mike tells the story of what happened after that. And and maybe there was some prescience on the part of this other person. So I want to have that conversation because I've been in many bands with female singers and I have some perspective to add. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. We'll 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 cue it up for next week. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll add to what you're saying, because I, have I told you this, but the house rockers, we made a decision again. If I'm going to make that three hour drive, I want a balance of the fun of what we've built and what we do, but money now becomes even more important for me, you know, to justify the the drives up. Right. Sure. And, 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 you know, it's going to be part of a much bigger part of my income these days. So, um, we are making the decision to add a female singer just to offer for corporate gigs and weddings. So, so, uh, what I, there was some discussion going in that if we're going to add them, we should add them. And I, and I wasn't for that. I was mm-hmm. like, we can play all our concert series and festivals. We have plenty of business like that. We continue to have plenty of business. But when I market the band on gig salad, um, I want, you know, to yeah. be able to do that and, and have that variety of, of repertoire uh, to pull it all together. So we uh, had discussions about who in our local area would be good people to use for that. Yep. Um, and how to build the business in that kind of like two brain, two perspective, like we're still the house rockers, but yep. you know, our, our corporate business, which, you know, some people will see us and want all the guys and we'll do that. But you know, you know, can we do this and offer a, a iteration of the house rockers that has a, you know, a wider uh, variety of, of music for that stuff. And so um, I'll be interested to kind of dig into this. And, you know, to be fair, we have danced around this conversation since we started this. I know Mary Ellen said she wanted to come on and talk about, yeah. the, you know, you know what it's like to be a female singer. And, you know, we've had a couple of, of, of more than a couple of messages throughout the years of people asking about this dynamic and this vibe. I've always felt like it's hard to have that conversation, um, frankly, without dancing towards a sexist perspective on it. Not, not well, that I'm it, sexist. It's, no, but by, no. by nature of even discussing the gender of the people in the band, it becomes it. a sexist conversation. Like it's it. impossible That's for it not to be right. Like whether, right. whether it's a positive or negative thing is a whole different story. I mean, it, what you just described for what you're doing with the house rockers, it, you know, it's like we're adding value by adding a, you know, a person that is not the same gender as the rest of us. Like, th- like that, that's the whole point of it. And and well, this happens in theater shows all the time too, right? Well, let, let me pause you right there. So you just said adding value. And um, that's actually been uh, the, the, the pro faction in the house rockers perspective on this is sure. like, we can do more. And totally. I'm like, I, I don't know that more is what we, we do good at what we have. Right. So but if you want to do say, weddings, you no, 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 but that's what I'm saying. I'm ah. saying we can do different. Right. Right. Fair. So yeah. I don't want to put a qualitative on it. You know, just, just cause someone can sing the higher notes <laughs> doesn't mean that that song is a better song than, you know, you know, singing a John Cougar, you know, song. Sure. If you do it well and are entertaining. So this goes back to always be performing. So I do agree that you are more marketable. Um, uh, if you can offer that kind of variety and, you know, if the band vibe is still entertaining and all that type of thing, you've just, you know, kind of created another dimension to what you do. Another dimension. I'm not, I, I just can't get myself to go to a, a, a bit. It's not a better dimension. It's a different dimension. If you're not going to take that dimension, you just got to be damn good. Cause you're probably competing against oh, bands yeah. who do offer yeah. that dimension. So how, what is going to make you, Right. So this goes back to always be performing. Like if you're a four piece classic rock band and you want to do weddings and, and you're going up against 10 piece bands with horns and, and, you know, female singers with ranges from, from God, you know, what, what's your four piece classic rock band going to offer that's better. And it's not, you haven't seen my, it's hard to, you haven't seen my sweet home Alabama. It's hard to even get the attention uh, of most of the people looking to book bands for weddings if you don't have the, you know, ability to add the, you know, the, the female singer and add the sax player, like those are pretty normal things. Not to say that you can't do it, but your, your pool of opportunities is just naturally less. And we could talk for days about, well, is it, does, you know, does that mean that the world is sexist? Well, I mean, the answer is in, in general, yes. I mean, we, we are aware of genders and, and it does influence our thoughts in a gender, in a general way. 
Um, but it like be that as it may in today's, well, today's market, it's a whole lot different, but last year's market, <laughs> it, you know, having that, like you said, it made you more marketable. So from that standpoint, more valuable in that you have that many more opportunities to compete for, as opposed to maybe 10% of the opportunities they're willing to consider. Okay. Well, they don't have female singer, but Check this out. Like you said, you haven't seen my fastball. So, uh, <laughs> you haven't, yeah, you haven't seen my sweet home, Alabama. Right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a tough thing, but we have like uptown celebration is, uh, you know, we have like the, the core band includes a female singer. You know, she is just part of the band. However, if somebody starts getting, you know, pulling the price down, well, one of the first things that can go away is, well, if you don't want, us to bring Rachel, then we can, we can play a gig without Rachel and we've done mm -hmm. them. You know, it becomes more of a rock gig than, uh, you know, a, it doesn't have that wedding, ele you know, that, that element of like, you know, singing bad girls and, you know, those sorts of things. Cause it's just not what we do without her. So it becomes more of a rock gig. And that's, you know, some people like we've done some weddings where people are like, actually, yeah. that's what we want. It's like, okay, this great. Is my point, Dave, this yeah. is like, you know, a, to be a corporate band, it just really implies a level of polish and professionalism, not necessarily repertoire. We, and totally then similarly true. for wedding, for weddings, many of the weddings we've gotten is because people want the vibe that they have, whether they, yeah. whether they've grown up with their parents coming to see us at the festivals and fairs and they feel nostalgic and connected to their community for that. I mean, that, that totally. might be a reason. And that's actually why we've gotten we, you know, as we've been the band in this area for, you know, several years now, if, if people want, you know, that, um, you know, and some people do want, you know, I, I want Beyonce sung at my, at my wedding. So, you know, then you go looking for something else, but, uh, always be performing rings really true in this. So you, you're not right? singing single ladies. Uh, Cause I think you could do a heck of a rendition of that, man. I like that Lizzo song. Um, oh yeah. Uh, good as hell. I like yeah. that one. Yeah. You, <laughs> I would you love could do to a good job one. with that. See? Yeah. Like, yeah, you could do a little Britney. You and, know? I, and there's, you know, we've done, we've done uh, come see about me by the, by the, um, the Supremes for years. Oh, yeah. And there's, you know, there's something fun about guys singing girl songs. Oh no, right? we used to I mean, in the responders, which was like very much a male, you know, testosterone kind of band. Uh, it, it, at least in the image that we projected, we were all kind of, you know, like <laughs> we weren't really alpha guys, but, but we projected that image, you know, it was very much this like raw testosterone, rock and roll, sweat pouring off the stage kind of band. We did a version of uh, back in my arms again by the Supremes and it killed every night. I mean, I, it was, it was worked out long before I joined the band and before I even started yeah. singing in the band. So, but the three of them had the harmonies just perfect. Oh my gosh. It was so much a fun good to play. Song's a good song. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Song power counted for that one for sure. Yeah. It was fun. And then you think about women in, in bands are often singing the Axl Rose, you know, the high yeah. male songs as well, the ACDC. And I, you, know, you see that quite a bit. I have had, it has taken me a long time and I would still say like, I'm, I mean, I'm still working on every aspect of my craft, but singing harmonies with female singers is something that did not come naturally to me at all. And I think it's largely because my range is generally about that I'm higher. I can sing higher than like most guys in bands, at least mm -hmm. in terms of harmonies. But I, that means I'm singing sort of in the natural range of female singers. And so the, it, you know, where I would be like, Oh, I'll go here for the harmony. It's like, Oh, nope, there you are. Okay. Got it. Okay. Let me figure something else out. You know, <laughs> like, uh, and it, it has taken me a long time to really get in with that. All those gigs I did with Amanda were really helpful. And she certainly wasn't the first, you know, woman that I sang with. I mean, this is, this is, I've noticed this for years with me is like getting that harmony blend with, you know, with guys for me has always with male voices has always been easy with female voices, the theater stuff that I've been doing. And the, and then like even bitter pill with Emily, cause she sings most of the leads of our tunes or maybe half of them. Um, starting to finally figure it out. And I'm starting to, I don't mean to say we, the rest of them can all sing. They're great. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm starting to finally like figure out, oh, okay, this is how you approach this. And here's, here's the, the automatic spots that I can go as opposed to, I mean, if we sit down and work it out, then that's easy. But you know, it's, it's like, okay, pick it up quick. Let's go. Let's go. It's like, okay, with guys, I no problem. I can usually sing every part. I just listen. Whoever's not singing a part, I grab it and I'm done. 
And then with, you know, if there's a woman on stage singing, it's like, okay, now I got to think a little differently and, and I'm starting to learn. So, which is good. You know, it's challenging. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's good. It'll be a good conversation. I, I might reach out to Mary Ellen and see if she wants to hop I'd on. I'd love to. Have, yeah. And I'm looking forward to have this conversation about Mike's question because it is totally different than the conversation we just had. <laughs> so, uh, because, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's certainly related, obviously. So, uh, yeah. send us, I, I have two things to mention here in the, in the outro of the show, make sure to send us your feedback at feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We love that stuff. And it really does help us kind of keep things moving here. It, it, um, it, it's the fuel that keeps the show going in a, in a lot of ways. So we'd love to hear from you. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And secondly, you mentioned masks, Paul, I, it, because you were, some of you were wearing masks at rehearsal and some of you weren't early on in the pandemic. Um, a friend of mine who is a, a, he's one of these people that just knows how to source things. It's what he does, right? He builds businesses around things he can source. And he figured out how to source KN95 masks, um, which give you, you know, both the outbound and inbound protection. And I find them very comfortable, especially if I'm in a scenario where I'm breathing heavily or I need to sing or whatever, because they hold their shape. Uh, so in addition to being addition, you know, having that extra protection, they also hold their shape. They're not like a cloth mask where you're, you know, I, for me, I find if I'm in that, you know, if I'm breathing heavy, I wind up chewing on the mask sometimes or whatever. And uh, so I put a link in the show notes to his company. You can buy any can 95 mask. I don't, I don't care. I'm just putting one in there. Cause that's the one that I've used. And I know about him only because he was a, he's been a friend for years. Uh, he's out in Vegas and like I said, he's just good at finding things. And I like people that are good at finding things. So, you know, I just figured I'd share. So, yeah, to do. Yep. That's it. And they're relatively cheap, too. Uh, like I said, I find them really comfortable. So, there you go. All right. That's all I got. Uh, Paul, you got anything else? We're good, man. All right. Well, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for sending in your feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And always be performing. That's it. Always. There's no reason not to. I mean, I guess maybe there is. You gotta be you're supposed to be quiet. <laughs> Listening, it's different. Uh-huh.